Please note that to the best of the institution's knowledge, all required permissions have been sought and given for this permission, for this presentation. Our presentation today is on the tragic collapse of the FIU pedestrian bridge in Miami, Florida, which claimed the lives of six people and injured eight. The cross safety alert issued after this collapse is one of the first collaborations between Cross UK and Cross US, and not only points out lessons learned, but also differences in how bridges are designed and constructed in the UK and the US. Steve Williams, our speaker, is the technical authority, principal discipline expert for capital delivery, buildings and civils at Network Rail. He has 30 years of design, construction and assurance experience as a consultant, a contractor and a client. He is a member of Cross UK's expert panel, which reviews and comments on cross reports and events. Steve's presentation will examine what happened in the lead up to the collapse, why the collapse happened, and what can be learned by the industry to avoid a repeat event. This report and presentation are great examples of what Cross can do to educate engineers and the industry on problems that can occur during all phases of a project. If you're not familiar with Cross, which stands for Collaborative Reporting for Structural Safety, this is a good chance to learn more about it and to sign up for safety alerts and newsletters. Steve will talk more about Cross during his presentation. We'll have the website available then and also at the end during Q&A. Presentation is about an hour long, leaving approximately a half hour for questions and answers. And now let's welcome Steve. Hi, Andy. Hi, hi everybody. Th uh, thanks for joining us. I heard that there's going to hopefully be a record event in terms of numbers today. So I hope you'll all be entertained and we'll go away with some some interesting uh, takes on uh, our cross spin on what happened on this event so that we can all learn from the event moving forward. Uh, just by way of further introduction, I, I'm a fellow of the iStruct and the ICE. Uh, I've been 33, 34 years in the game since I was a student engineering back in 87, when my boss at the time, a guy called Brian Bridges, uh, introduced me to health and safety by saying he's insistent on wearing hard hats on all sites. This was before CDM. Uh, and, and the reason why is because he explained that when he was a young lad himself, he wore a hard hat and had a a bolt drop five stories and lodge in his uh, helmet, saving his life. So I've always remembered that story that was told to me about on my first day of work, really. And hence my passion and enthusiasm for safety uh, in construction. So let's let's go on. So lots to talk about in the next hour or so. I will uh, be as brief as I can. There's a lot to go through in the slides. I'm going to make no excuses whatsoever for having very wordy slides because I understand this is being recorded and you'll be able to freeze frame on the recording and look in detail at some, some of the information that I will be uh, more or less skipping over in, in this presentation. So you can see there, there's a lot to go through. I'm going to be talking a bit about cross first, then talking about the, the, the bridge, both the proposal uh, and then what happened uh, via the collapse, why it happened. Uh, some recommendations from the NTSB have been absolutely pivotal in, in being able to provide the information that we've we've used in this. And then why Cross decided it would be really good to have a safety al alert, the, de the design and development of that alert and the recommendations. I'm also going to talk very briefly about something called soft hazards and uh, then some uh, suggested further reading before a conclusion so, uh, so, uh, slide where hopefully you can take away a few thoughts for the future. So without further ado, oh, of course, there will be a Q&A following that. So CROSS, Collaborative Reporting for safety, Safer Structures. Uh, it, it goes back to 76, uh, before my time. Uh, I was only 10 years old then. And it's it's been formed for many decades and has provided some really, really useful information. So anybody on the uh, call who hasn't heard of CROSS, there'll be a link coming up soon. Please do register. Uh, please do make full use of the panel of people on that report and all the uh, on, on, on CROSS. 
and all the information that flows from it because it's great industry advice. So as it developed, it became international. We had Cross Australasia join us and then latterly uh, Cross US. And this is very much, as Andy says, a collaborative effort between uh, us on both sides of the pond. Uh, in 2021, we expanded the remit to cover both si fire safety and structural safety. This is in, in uh, as a consequence, really, of the the uh, learning that's coming out of Grenfell and, and legislation that's about to change. So we now got a quite a comprehensive team and we're going from strength to strength. So that what do CROSS do? Uh, what we do is we encourage people to make reports. Uh, those reports are not seen by the panel. Uh, they are anon uh, anonymized by a, a team of a few people, all in full confidentiality. And only when they're an, uh, anonymized do the expert panel get to look at them and, and comment on them. We will chew the cud and decide what is the best learning that comes out of that, whether it's lessons learned or importantly, good practice. Of course, good practice is often the, the inverse of lessons learned. So the two are hand in hand. We then have a legal review before we do a final review, and only then does the report get published. We, we, we believe this builds a really good safety culture, and it supports, as it says at the bottom, that, that values the sharing of safety-related information and learning from each other's experiences. So we, we believe it's a fantastic industry tool. So here's a bit of a slide that hundreds of of reports have been analysed to come up with this slide. And the concerns or occurrences have their root causes in, in, in these four areas. Uh, demolition being very dangerous, but for, fortunately, very few uh, demolition uh, events uh, are reported to cross uh, because hopefully there are very few events. Uh, but certainly when you look at this stat, it was a bit of a surprise to me to see this stat things, concerns or occurrences uh, that go on primarily are reported in site, but they're pri primarily caused by design issues. Uh, and then there's quite a, f quite a lot there, 25% in normal use. So this really does show that, it that, that the reporting covers the end-to-end -end process of, of the design and execution of a project. And of course, it's running and finally it's demolition. So Cross International, uh, has grown from strength to strength. And it, 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 I've, I've highlighted a few words there. The problems of structural safety issues are all of almost universal concern. What you'll see is, although the language is slightly different between the UK and the US, and certainly the standards and, and uh, the processes are different, the things that happen are are the same things that happen all over the world. And so we can recognize these and have a, a enhanced portfolio of learning for lessons learned and good practice by international cooperation. And the cross website account has been recently updated. It's a, it's a totally different beast from anybody who's not been on it in the past six months or so. And there's the link. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to, to sign up. Uh, I'm sure you will do by the time you've heard what I've got to say today. Uh, and, and whether or not you're in Australasia or across, uh, or UK or the USA or anywhere else in the world, uh, you, why not sign up to all three? And also you can decide whether or not you want to look at structural safety or fire safety. And as most people do, both it would be good. So that's something about CROSS. Uh, when we first heard of the, uh, the, the Florida FIU incident, uh, we were obviously hor horrified in the same way as most people who've seen it were, were horrified. And that, the first question is, why on earth has this happened? So developing on all the things that have come out of the learning and, and, and the truly inspirational work that the NTSB have done, uh, providing a lot of the information that's source material for this presentation. Uh, we decided in, in, in CROSS, and at the time it was known as SCOS and CROSS, which is why the language is a bit different there. Uh, we decided in CROSS UK that we would really like to 
formally look at an alert because we noticed a number of patterns of occurrences that, that correlate with a number of other reports. So uh, a lady called Vlad Palin from Highways England and myself were, were charged with and, and gladly accepted the challenge to, to produce uh, the SCOS alert, which is downloadable from the site uh, that you're on today. And uh, there's a link there as well. And in the development of that, we went through various iterations. We, we chewed the cut about a lot of other uh, events that had occurred uh, and, and reports that were issued over the years. And we worked in harmony with Glenn Bell, Andy Herman, who's of course uh, chairing today's meeting, and Alistair St uh, Sohn, who, who, who's the, the chief for, for Cross UK. And together we worked on and then got legal uh, viewpoint on both both sides of the pond to, to come up with the SCOS alert uh, that you will hopefully have read. And if you haven't read, you can download it now. Uh, a truly collaborative approach and, and one which I hope you uh, see as, as beneficial when you've heard the rest of my uh, work. So on to the FIU bridge proposal. This is what uh, uh, an image taken from the design and build technical proposal showing a two span uh, bridge. It's not cable to stay. The, the cables are actually pipes and they were used for deflection reasons. So I understand. Uh, but effectively, it's a it's a, a, a in situ cast uh, reinforced concrete structure with post tensioning, extensive post tensioning with two spans uh, central column and uh, unfortunately not all of this structure got constructed so this is a an image taken from one of the signed bridge construction drawings showing it in more detail i appreciate it's a busy uh, uh, a busy diagram but it illustrates the form of of the uh, structure and on the next slide you can see a cross section. Now that cross section will be illustrated in a couple of photographs in a minute or two. Uh, but basically, I, I must admit, I'm old enough to remember when it was feet and inches in England. So I'm quite, I'm quite okay looking at uh, feet and inches on drawings. Uh, but for those who are not used to feet and inches, we're talking about something that's almost five meters wide at the canopy. Uh, it's, it's only two foot, 600 millimetres thick at its thickest point of the deck, 10 metres wide approximately, uh, weigh, weighs just over 900 tonnes, the main span that collapsed, and is heavily post-tensioned. What's unusual about this and makes it very novel is the fact that there's only one line. The truss is actually just one truss was typically in, in construction. You'd have two rows of trusses. So this is, I'm, I'm going to dwell on this for a couple of minutes, the, the, if that, the construction sequencing was carefully thought through, uh, as it should be, of course, and a lot of work went into making sure that the construction sequencing worked throughout. Uh, you can see in the bottom left, the use of SPMTs to do transport and more of that in a minute. Uh, but we only got as far as the erection of the main span before the uh, event occurred. The other, the other span had not been constructed. And just for completion, this is the, the last of the st eight stages of construction, illustrating uh, how it, the structure should have ended up. So this is a bit more of a a diagram that illustrates the collapsed main span and it illustrates the point of failure being the 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 junction between the last horizontal uh, sorry the last diagonal uh, member and the column and more of that in, in a short while it's 53 meters uh, long and it it collapsed at that point it was unusual design it's 53 meters pre-stressed uh, precast concrete in places uh, in situ in others is actually built offline. I'll come to that in a minute. And what's what's important to note here is that uh, the cracks appeared at the node. You'll see this in a while. And over a period of almost three weeks, they visibly worsened until the bridge collapse occurred. So I'll just reiterate that point. These cracks were visible and growing for three weeks before it occurred. 
So these are the main parties uh, to the design. One of the things that's important with cross, and I, and I didn't mention it earlier, um, is the, well, I did actually th come to think of it. I mentioned anonymization of information. So the it, FDOT and FIU were, were the client and, and the state governance. Uh, and and we've, we've removed the names of the, the, the other parties However, of course, they, those names are freely available and publicly, uh, publicly available information that are in the links. But what, what we basically had was a DMB contractor, uh, equivalent really to a CDMPC within the UK. We had the contractor's designer employed by the DMB contractor, who in the US speak is the engineer of record. We had a separate construction engineering inspection contract, which is a rare beast indeed in the UK. And that was uh, that uh, team were employed by the client for contract admin, site monitoring, and materials inspection. And then we got the independent peer reviewer. The U the US uh, used the word peer review. Uh, in in UK, the language is design checker. So the peer reviewer was re required uh, for this uh, defined as a novel structure. And he, he, they they were employed by the contractor's designer to do the checking. So, so let's go into what happened. Firstly, this, the span was cast off site, and uh, before moved into possession, it was it, into position. It was moved by an SPMT, and, and accelerated bridge construction was the term used. There's a number of different terms for the use of these machines, but they're growing more and more. Uh, they're becoming more and more frequent in use and they provide an excellent means of allowing construction off site and then moving into position quickly to minimize the effects on uh, the likes of, in this case, traffic or in the railway industry to minimize the effects of tra uh, stopping trains running. So there's, a, there's an image at the top and that shows just after placing, they, uh, they removed the uh, stress from some pre-stressed bars in the diagonal that, that was precipitation of the collapse. And a photograph on the bottom right is, is in situ uh, just a few hours before the actual collapse and the, the, a decision had been made to re-stress the, the, the rods in the diagonal. Uh, and it was whilst that activity was taking place that the collapse occurred. This is a, a photograph uh, showing you what the reality of that diagram looks like. You can see that it's heavily, uh, it, well, the large uh, black circles are the pr uh, post tension uh, uh, area of the, the building and the bottom in the middle going through the column is actually a drain pipe. Uh, this was the situ uh, situation as it looked when it was being transported and I'm, I've been told you can see my cursor is that area that collapsed and more on that in a moment. So so what actually happened? Let's have a look at the uh, cracking. Top left is the cracking that occurred uh, whilst it was still uh, being built uh, just, just in the casting yard. So we'd already got a few cracks and these cracks were occurring in this area here. And during the course of the next few weeks, things developed. And the, the photographs taken are just a few days before the collapse. You can see that the diagonal crack there has opened up significantly. And, and, uh, and this was taken a bit further along, showing the state of the concrete in this area. Now, now you, you might look at that and think there's some significant cracking happening here. Well, I'm not actually looking at any cracking occurring. I'm actually seeing parts of the structure moving apart under load. Uh, the, the, this is well beyond cracking and, and, and is certainly described as structural distress. What's actually happened is that the diagonal coming down has moved horizontally along this interface here and, and, and has started to crack up and open up the, uh, the structure. So on to the next slide. So these are more views not long before collapse. Uh, it, this is an aerial view of this area here. And what's actually happening is and these are the two faces that you saw in the earlier photograph. What's actually happening is the diagonal is pushing the column out and all of the concrete in this area here is starting to move horizontally. So it's failing uh, and yet 
no decision was made to close the road. It's something I, I, I genuinely find flabbergasting when I see the state of the cracking that occurred. So what happened on Thursday, the March 15th, it collapsed. Two of the lanes were closed. They were al allowing the the restressing operation to carry on. And unfortunately, one bridge worker and five vehicle occupants died. Uh, others were injured. And the NTSB urgently sent a team to investigate. Uh, this is not the first time you'll hear this, but all parties apparently failed to recognise the bridge was in danger when inspected hours before the collapse. In hindsight, the magnitude of the cracks warranted that the road be immediately closed and the trust supported to reduce loads pending further uh, uh, evaluation. And I mentioned three weeks uh, uh, earlier, it wasn't quite three weeks, but uh, the, the cracks appeared uh, and then over 19 days the cracks grew until during restressing the bridge collapsed. Uh, it's interesting to note that the engineer of record at the design firm repeatedly stated that the cracks were of no safety concern. So all the structural engineers on this call uh, make of that what you will. So I'm just going to play you the collapse. Here, look away now if you don't want to see it. I can run it. This is slow-mo. And this was taken from the NTSB investigation. I'm just going to run it one more time. So this is the collapse in slow-mo. Now, some might be surprised to hear that the total time from the commencement of the collapse to the end of the collapse was 0.23 seconds. So in a quarter of a second, it went bang and it was down. Uh, yet we had nearly three weeks to puzzle the likely consequences if the worst was to happen. Uh, so I'm going to show it once more time. There you go. That's enough of that one. So in, in a nutshell, what happened is the collapse started at this lower node. As this started to be overloaded, it started to come down and it formed hinges in these locations here. It then commenced its collapse. And like I say, it was all done within 0.25, of a second. Uh, this is a, a, a famous, or should I say infamous, photograph of the not long after the event and you can see this diagonal which was pointing downwards is now pointing upwards and you can see that the the entirety of the connection has has failed and the deck is is down at floor level it just brings home to roost the consequences of of making the wrong decisions uh, and hopefully none of us on this call will ever have to be involved in the outcomes that occurred on this particular site on your own projects. And, and I'm hoping that the learning that, that, that uh, Vlad, uh, myself and others have, have uh, put into the uh, SCOS alert will be of use to, to ensure that such occurrences never happen again in the future. And, and we owe a debt of gratitude really to the NTSB. We have in the UK in rail, we've, we've got the, the RAVE, the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. Uh, but I don't think we've got a national, uh, a national body that looks at uh, things in the way the NTSB do. They they were pivotal in the investigation and also in providing so a, a huge wealth of information that has been really useful to the structural engineering community to really understand what was going on with the structure and and of course to the wider construction industry in understanding some of the processes that that, that did go wrong and that that hopefully won't happen again. Now, the U US Department of Labor is a, a little bit like, but not quite the same as our HSE, and they were involved uh, too. So there's a few report statements there. I'm not going to quote them all, but I will quote the one that's highlighted. The failure of all concerned parties to recognize and take action on the threat to public safety presented by the significant observed bridge structure distress prior to the collapse led to the tragic loss of life in this preventable accident. Uh, and and it's easy for, for me to sit here now with the benefit of hindsight and say that that was the case. I'm sure nobody ever intended this to happen. Of course they didn't. Uh, but nevertheless, it did happen. And that's what happens when things go wrong. Nobody intended for them to go wrong, but they do go wrong. Uh, hopefully the recommendations will help put things right for the future. So a little bit more about 
why it happened. It was a punch and shear failure. And this is the photograph of the top left is, a, is an image taken of the deck when it having been recovered. And like I was explaining earlier, member 11 and 12 effectively went horizontal. And the whole of this, uh, and this is the cracking pattern. And you can see that cracking pattern clearly in the bits of concrete that, that are missing and the bits that remain. And a couple of important points to, to note is that the this pipe and these vertical sleeves were cast in. And I don't know whether or not these are part of the design or they were accounted for in the design. I just simply do not know. But you often on, on structural jobs have the MEP people wanting their holes and their pipes going in the way you, where you, do, where you don't want them. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that this is a, an issue for this particular job, but certainly our jobs do pay attention to the, where your holes need to go because uh, half the weight of the entire structure, so 450 odd tons, uh, if you know your trust design, were coming down that member uh, multiplied by in excess of route over two because the angle was uh, shallower than than 45 degrees. So there was a huge amount of weight coming down in this one location, just where you've got a drain pipe and just where you've got other pipes. Uh, what they did on the day was try and uh, and Perhaps, and I'm, I'm not going to speculate, but they 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 decided that that it would be a good idea to retention the rods that were used, uh, and 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 I'll just come on to that and maybe flick back to this. So, in the temporary condition during the move, this part of the structure cantilevered over the SPMT, and clearly that member there, the member that gave up number eleven, uh, was in. Tension. So what they did is part of the design, and it was all sequenced, is they put uh, rods in, in, in there so that they could tension them up and create a compressive state to hold it in position. And then the sequencing allowed for them to be de-stressed. But I'm just going to flick back to the to the last. The, the shims were not put in underneath this heavily concentrated area. Uh, and, and the, the cracks were developing despite the fact that the 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 shims didn't replicate the final bearing so that might have had a bearing on what what occurred but certainly the decision was made to to restress now this is the permanent condition and the condition in the temp uh, in the casting yard clearly that's in compression okay and there was distress occurring here and then the decision was made to to tension up these rods now to me Noting the pattern of, uh, of distress that I showed you earlier and noting that these rods are within the plane of the single truss. The last thing one would expect to do as a structural engineer is put more compression into the member that is going horizontally in this direction. It just It's counterintuitive to me and plenty of people that I've sp spoken to at the moment. Yet that was that was the decision that was made when it when it finally did collapse. Uh, not that it wouldn't have collapsed uh, anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll go on to that in a second. So, so why have I said that? Co probable co cause. The bridge had structural deficiencies due to inadequate design, which contributed to the collapse. So there was an underestimation of loads and an overestimation of capacity. Uh, the designer using incorrect loads and load factors in its calculations. These results errors resulted in a node that lacked the capacity to resist the shear force. In fact, it was almost a factor of two out. Uh, the engineer didn't consider the loadings from all critical construction stages. The temporary condition of the permanent structure was inadequately considered. And then peer review in the checking process. Now, uh, evidence provided by, by other bodies tells us that the peer reviewer dropped his price under pressure from the designer because there wasn't enough budget to do the checking. So the peer reviewer warned the designer that in seeking lower bids, the FIU should be aware that a lesser fee may be associated with less effort. So to me, that's dead simple. It's corner cutting. Uh, the investigators found that the peer reviewer failed to meet the requirements for a peer reviewer. And the construction sequence didn't include the retensioning of the rods. So the evaluation of the cracks by the engineer record and his recommendation to retension the post-tension bars were not in the original design. So they should have been 
subject to peer review. Now, I've been on plenty of jobs or I've heard through cross of plenty of jobs where decisions have been made on site and the designer has not been involved, yet alone the checker has been involved in the decisions that have been made. And that, that's something I'm going to uh, come back to shortly. So causes two of two. The designer didn't know why the cracks were occurring. Uh, so should he have, well, I'm saying, should have acted to instruct the highway to be closed. Well, that's conjecture. But notwithstanding that, they did not know why these cracks were occurring. The modelling didn't show the cracks occurring, yet they were occurring that in plain sight of the people on the site. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier the drainage pipe location and the vertical ducts. They, they all weaken the structure locally. Uh, the bridge engineers and the construction engineering inspector failed to classify the cracks as structurally significant. They were over 40 times wider than allowed and they were growing. And you see what the OSHA has said here. The concrete trust had developed numerous wide and deep structural cracks, jeopardising the integrity of the bridge. Now, when they did that retentioning, if you can imagine, the, the, the concrete was already cracking up. It was already moving the steel was already yielding it was in a right old state and the last thing you do is then add more compression into the joint that's actually failing uh, there is some talk which i'm not going to dwell on in this particular space because the usa and, and uk uh, design codes differ but there is some talk about whether or not the consideration of redundancy uh, is, is something that 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 is a factor uh, bearing in mind the criticality of this one node taking half the weight of the bit of the uh, structure. So the NTSB then made a number of recommendations, and I and I've just did a couple of uh, I've, I've put on this slide just a few of the freely available uh, recommendations are out, out there, and and the, there's some recommendations. And I'm not going to dwell on these to so the Florida Transport Departmentation. The, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and to the designer. Uh, and these are very much a summary of, uh, of the few pages. And, uh, and, and why I'm not dwelling on them is A, that they're freely available if you want to look. Uh, and B, the recommendations in there res resonated strongly with the 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 cross and we we have four meetings here and in those in that in one of those meetings that was where the decision was made that we really need to con, uh, convert this information in, into an alert for the benefit of UK and, and the wider industry taking into account what we've learned from other cross work so on to structural design it is essential that non-structural service voids are placed only in locations with the written permission of the structural engineer so Whereas that may or may not have happened at, at FIU, it's certainly something that is very important uh, in, in order to ensure structural strength. Then on to the design and design check category. Now, in the UK, we've got uh, in highways, we've got GC300 for the technical approval of highway structures. And, and in railway, we, we, we've got the engineering and architectural assurance of building and civil engineering works. These put processes in place that define design check categories. And in this uh, particular case, we would have had a CAT 3 check. Uh, in the Florida Bridge collapse, this would include a fully independent consideration of all temporary conditions by the permanent works and the temporary works engineers. Uh, that would have happened, we believe, in the UK, but I don't think it happened on this particular job. So there's a recommendation. Now, this is an, abst uh, an abstract from the Network Rail Assurance Standard. And, and I'm not going to dwell on it for, for more than a few seconds because I'm going to uh, just draw your attention to what it's got on the left-hand side during the early grip stages, as they're known, and that's been replaced by something called PACE. There, there are, during the feasibility and option selection, we insist on, on early contractor involvement so the temporary works are considered, so that the, the design of the permanent works and the temporary works design are considered at the earliest stage. And as the design develops, they become an integrated part of the whole. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that the there was a decision made to change the sequencing of the design so the the per, the temporary condition of the permanent works was changed contrary to the sequencing that had previously been agreed and 
I'll, I'll draw your attention to this freely available design uh, guidance note, early focus and constructability in temporary works. I, I run the health and safety of our design uh, buildings and civils working group for network rail and that really is a true collaboration between network rail and the supply chain and it's the supply chain and some some specialists in, in, in network rail who work collaboratively to produce this guidance it's freely available it's a great read for you do not have to be on the railway to make use of the lessons learned and the good practice in in that document and and one rare occurrences it's reference to the hsc's l153 which is the guidance for the cdm regulations in the uk and it says as you can see there but i'm going to read the last bit they should also liaise with the pd throughout the construction phase on matters such as changes to the designs and the implications these may have for managing health and safety risks so i would be expecting our projects to if there was a change to the sequencing that could affect health and safety risks i would expect the pc and the pd to be liaising with the designers to make sure that those changes are properly engineered and properly checked before they are implemented so some some words here and I, i'm looking at the times that i've only got 15 minutes but we get in there site supervision and independent checking of the execution of the works this, this is something that, that is is important in the UK, in the past 20 odd, well, let's say 30 odd years, when I was a pup, I, I cut my teeth uh, doing roads jobs. And I was actually the resident engineer, although I wasn't chartered at the time, so I wasn't officially the resident engineer. I was, I was acting as a resident engineer. And we had resident engineers and we had clerks of works and we had a higher level of quality control than one might say is the case these days. I'll leave that thought at that. But as you can see from all the, the people involved in the Florida FIU, the, were, uh, the, the designer was on site. The, the, the people were involved to make the right decisions. Uh, and and I, we've said in the cross alert that there's no such equivalent position in modern contract procurement within the UK. Well, I'm going to put my hand up to that because uh, that's, that's an error. Uh, we're all human. And in the NEC contract, there is something called a supervisor. Now, I don't know who makes use of the supervisor within NEC contracts. I'm not aware that Network Rail do, uh, but certainly a supervisor will act independently to the project managers and is responsible for monitoring, witness testing, checking and compliance with the works information. So the thought is, should we be doing more of that in the UK? Because it did happen with FIU although the, 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 it still resulted in w w what it did. My question to the audience is, uh, without those benefits that were happening in the U USA, uh, how close may we have come to similar events occurring on this side of the pond? And the words you can read at leisure, uh, they're in the SCOS alert. So ne next one, construction oversight. All part parties apparently failed to recognise the bridge was in danger when inspected hours before the collapse. I won't read the rest of that because it'll be at least the second time you've heard of that. Uh, but what I will draw your attention to is, is the CDM regs and, and, and the SCOS recommendation, the, the Cross UK recommendation, that all CDM duty holders are defined with lead name, uh, with leads named on all projects. So duty holder accountabilities and responsibilities are clear to all. There's a go per to person to go to. In fact, the network rail uh, way in which we deal with CDM regulations, something called OHS 0047, uh, specifically has a requirement to do that. Uh, how often on your projects are the CDM accountabilities, the duty holders responsibilities, a little bit muddy? So I'll leave you to ponder over that. But having them clear, I think, is a good thing for business. Uh, also, a couple of things, bottom left hand side, I'll just focus on the one. Uh, there is a case for more education in spotting faults and structural weaknesses amongst site staff who will know when to call in relevant expertise. So there, there we're putting a case forward for, for people to say, this isn't quite right here. We need to get somebody in to have a look. Uh, and I'm aware of cases where 
our DMB procurement strategy has effectively prevented engineers getting on site who could have helped with issues that became uh, issues as things developed. I'd like to see that uh, eliminated if at all possible. I'm sure everybody in the industry would agree. So let's go to the recommendations. So on the left hand side, we've got uh, the recommendations as written in the Scotch alert. And, and, and on the right hand side, my take on things. So what if contingency plannings, constructability reviews, what if scenarios? Ask how could this fail and what are the consequences? So an FIU, if somebody completely independent rocked up on site and said, looking at what I'm looking at, uh, there is a possibility that this bridge might collapse. What should we be doing about it? Uh, that sort of thinking would provoke conversations that might have resulted in different outcomes. So we've talked about crap width. So those who are structural engineers know about crap widths and 0.2 millimetres and 0.3 millimetres and bridge design codes, etc. But but why were we thinking a, a crack that's three quarters of an inch wide is is, is not a problem? Uh, so are the right people looking at things at the right time? Uh, due to increase, this is very controversial. We've had some feedback on this. Due to the increasingly fragmented nature of the industry, it is often observed that engineering decisions are made by non-engineers without consulting competent engineers. Well, it, it, it's, it's interesting that the feedback from engineers is this is very true. And the feedback from en non-engineers is, what do you mean? That doesn't happen. Why is this a problem? Why is it a widespread issue? Well, engineers are trained to 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 understand in a way that non-engineers are not trained to understand what might be happening when things start going wrong and physically, uh, you, when you can see the physical signs of things going wrong. So we, we have numerous examples on file where where decisions have been made to value engineer solutions, but without the engineering involvement and therefore without giving full consideration of the consequences of those decisions. And I believe there is a case for the industry to improve in that regard. So we've got about 10 left. DMB procurement strategy, I touched on this earlier. So do designers get to site often enough or is this seen as an unnecessary cost? Well, I believe that nothing could be further from the truth and so do many people in uh, cross UK. I believe in cross U US as well. And, and certainly in the conversations I've been having on various events that have not gone to plan uh, within, within my own part of the world. Now, should we be building requirements to con contracts where, for instance, professional supervision is needed? And by way of example, if a large embankment uh, is of complicated and complex engineering and there is a call for engineering supervision on site uh, by appropriately uh, suitably qualified and experienced people, SQUEPS, uh, then should our procurement routes allow that to happen. If they do, great. If they don't, maybe there's room for improvement. So we need to train engineers to recognise through learning experience the early warnings of failure. Uh, so more site supervision by, by uh, consultancies with contractors and more collaboration between consultancies and, and, and contractors might allow that spreading of knowledge between uh, parties to to uh, spot issues before they come serious and we've got plenty of examples within cross where that hasn't happened so we must do it do more to ensure competency so i could speak all day about competency but here's an idea allow reciprocal secondments between companies to give people experience on site and in the office do more of that and i'm sure it will help embed lessons learned and good practice it also allows improvement in mentoring which is something the industry sadly lacks. And then finally on this screen, there is un often undue pressure on duty holders, which can lead to compromising quality and safety. So this is an unacceptable behaviour, which, which we believe needs to be rooted out. Now, it might be the client that's steering this or contractor steering this or consultant steering this. But, but either way, 
we need to give people time to do what they need to do and get things checked uh, before we we uh, pile on the pressure too much. So I'm going to ask a question. I do not know the answer to this. What pressure were the various members of the FIU team under to keep the road open despite the clear warning signs of structural failure? So I would suggest that nobody actually did the right thing in those circumstances. So a couple of things, competent professionals to exercise their professional judgment in a collaborative working environment without the fear of adverse consequences. I, uh, we in Network Rail have got something called close calls and we've also got something called speak out. And these are processes whereby we do encourage the open reporting of concerns and, and hopefully they will catch things before they become unfortunate events. So I would say do the right thing here, folks. Call, speak to people in always in a collaborative way uh, and root out bullying tactics which can lead to unsafe occurrences and 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 the the, the one below that just builds on the same thing uh, how often are you asked to build based on unimproved drawings to maintain progress what pressure are you under to get things out the door when they're not quite ready how often do you do you do buyers source cheaper products which don't do the job so ask yourself these questions and ask yourself, are we cutting corners when we shouldn't be? Uh, so I believe the industry needs to do the right things with the right time to do them. So I'm nearly there now, folks. I'm going to introduce to you very quickly a concept devised by a guy called John Carpenter, who's many decades of experience in UK construction and was pivotal in the formation of Cross back in the day in the 70s uh, and has been pivotal in numerous uh, considerations of designing a safer built environment, which is his recently launched book, and that's available at the ICE, uh, at the link below. What he, what he said is soft hazards are something which has the potential to cause harm, originating as part of the design process, but which does not result in the work activity on site. Now, if you think back to the start of this presentation, where I showed you that 36% or thereabouts of the of the uh, causes of issues that have been reported to cross are from design activities. Uh, and then you look at examples like the lack of appropriate review and checking of the design, the lack of adequate management and oversight, the insufficient clarity as to the responsible chain of command, the failure to identify and specify the specific site supervision levels required, and the inadequate management of temporary works now, in John's own view, uh, and expressing what uh, I thoroughly recommend is a very, very interesting read. Uh, this is where the major risks lie. And, and that struck a chord with me because having spent so long researching and developing with Vlad and others, the SCOS alert, I thought this, 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 this book is trying to solve uh, so many of the issues that have, that have found themselves occurring on FIU. So I thoroughly re re recommend that as a read. So I want to now further reading. I've got four slides to show you here and I'm going to whiz through these. I've got a few minutes left. The, the first is the health and safety by design guidance that I mentioned earlier, freely available to anybody in the, uh, uh, anybody who wants to click on the link. And then there's also something I haven't mentioned today, the Get It Right initiative. Now I went to the launch of this uh, uh, a few years ago at the ICE headquarters. And, and, and the late, great Tom Barton uh, was the inspiration to get the Get It Right initiative off the ground. And, and it looks, it's an industry body uh, with a number of members, Network Rail and many consultants, contractors and others, all with a common goal to try and reduce errors and get things right. Now, they recently uh, formed a strategic leadership group, and, I, I, and I, I'm quoting from one of the people on that uh, leadership group when, when that person says, getting the process right is relatively straightforward. It's the cultural and behavioural aspects of the work that re represent our biggest industry challenge. It's my experience that things go wrong because somebody has ignored the process or prevented it from being applied as intended. Uh, so... Dwelling on what you've heard so far, do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? It'd be interesting to know. Uh, forensic en Engineering is a, is a great series of uh, 
information on IC pub. And, and there is one on there. I couldn't actually find the link to this, so I apologise. What lies behind uh, structural errors and failures in the UK? And there's some some interesting takes on this, and this is just one abstract uh, on, on, on management systems. And I'll just draw your attention to one thing here. Tick boxing management systems should be discouraged and real engagement employed for realistic quality systems, including corrective actions. Now, that to me reads the things I've been recommending so far. It means getting people on site, getting people really engaged, collaboratively working, early contractor involvement, considering temporary works and permanent works as one and making sure that you've got a safe uh, design and execution all the way through. So two or four, I haven't uh, even mentioned the, the excellent temporary works forum. Uh, the, if you, please go onto this site if you've not seen it before. There's a wealth of really good guidance, and, and there's four links there. Uh, one of the uh, the documents that I was involved in uh, producing is is was recently launched in October 20, and it's Constructability: A Guide to Reducing Temporary Works. And there's a wealth of really good information, lessons learned, and good practice in that document. And also the TWF invited Akram Malik from TGP to give a presentation on the Florida bridge collapse. Uh, and, and he looks at it from a more detailed temporary works perspective. And I'd thoroughly recommend that you go on to that, that, that if you're a member uh, and, and look at the recording. Here, there are a whole list of links and these are where a lot of the source material is, is provided. One of these links to the NTSB investigation is actually a three hour marathon, which is the presentation of the results of the investigation. And I assure you, if you do nothing else as a consequence of what you heard this evening, that you find that link out and that you click on it and you spend three hours of your time uh, listening to the things that went on in the aftermath and in the lead up to to the Florida FIU, because they are it, the three hours is utterly fascinating and well worth seeing. the The video clip of the collapse is just one of the uh, abstracts from from that event that I've used in in the preparation of this material. Thoroughly uh, recommended. And then finally, four of four, we're nearly there. The references as shown here are actually the references from the cross alert. So after the meeting, you'll have the cross alert. And those live res references, at least they were live when we published them, uh, do repeat some of the references that were, were discussed in the previous slide. So just drawing your attention to that. So. So last but not least, thoughts for the future. So I'm repeating it again, and I'm going to repeat it purposefully. This event occurred from a complex sequence of unfortunate events. But one thing is for certain, the warning signs of distress were clear, and the road traffic under the bridge could have and should have been stopped as a precautionary measure. I would like to know if anybody disagrees with that. <laughs> uh, so... Ask yourself a few questions. How are your projects ensuring that the works are executed to the approved for construction design rather than something that is less than that? Have both the permanent works and the temporary work sequencing been fully designed, including the consideration of all the temporary conditions of the permanent structure? And has all that sequencing been appropriately checked? And is there appropriate supervision by appropriately experienced people on the project, including engineering supervision where appropriate? It is not always appropriate, but there are plenty of circumstances where appropriate engineering supervision is necessary. So if things aren't right, are the right people looking at them? Probably a difficult one to answer. I'll give you some clues. Are any necessary changes to any part of the design or execution sequence verified by the designer? Very important. And are the risks being appropriately assessed and eliminated, reduced, informed and controlled so far as is reasonably practicable at all times? Uh, let's go back to the Health and Safety at Work Act for that one. And have you adequately considered the simple question, what if? Uh, my humble view, contingency planning is essential. And are you going to cite, irrespective of the conditions of the contract, 
to be those independent eyes and ears, of course, with a collaborative approach in mind. And finally, have you signed up for CROSS and will report concerns of any, time we got, of any kind regarding bridges or structures during design, execution and use? If you haven't, please make use of the service because I'm certain that we will all benefit as an industry uh, if, if more people do what many hundreds of people already do do. One last thought. What are you going to do differently moving forward as a consequence of what you've heard this evening? So I hope you've enjoyed that, folks. I, I, I appreciate it was a whistle-stop tour, but there's plenty to go for. Uh, and, and now I believe that I'm, I'm going to open up for questions and answers. Andy, back to you, sir. All right, Steve. Uh, normally at this point, we would ask for a round of applause for Steve, but he won't hear it. <laughs> So, but thank you, Steve. That was a fantastic presentation. We have received a number of questions and uh, to allow uh, Steve to catch his breath a little bit here. I just want to point out a couple things before we start into the actual questions. Uh, you can download the report, the SCOS cross report on this on the links page. So if you haven't done that already, you can do that. Also, um, let me just start going through some of these questions. The first question uh, is, will Cross get involved with the collapse of the Champlain Tower in Miami Beach? <laughs> um, Steve, let me uh, answer that. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, since it's a Cross US question. Uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology is investigating the collapse right now and they're collecting samples. We anticipate that Cross US will work with NIST. Um, next question, what's going on? Ronan Point has almost immediate change to building regulations. Renfield happens and no immediate change to outdated fire regulations. Are we as society getting dumber or asking less from those in power? Uh, let me, uh, Steve, if you don't mind, I'll touch on what's happening in the US and then you can talk about the With pleasure. Uh, Renfield fire. Um, as part of the National Transportation Safety Board report, uh, they made a recommendation that the American Association of State Highway and Transportation officials would work with the Federal Highway Administration to develop a requirement that concrete bridge structures be designed with reasonable estimates for interface shear demand, the cohesion and friction contributions to interface shear capacity, and the clamping force across the interface shear surface. Also to add a discussion about redundancy to the uh, LRFD guide specification for the design of uh, bridges uh, and also to the design of pedestrian bridges. So the recommendations were made and we're waiting to find out what happens to the codes. Okay. So Steve, we, yeah, another we, question. What is the size of cracks seen in the photos before the collapse happened? So, so if I may, Andy, was there a question about Grenfell beforehand? Steve, we can't hear you. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come back in. Hi, folks, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened there, guys, but I'm back anyway. So, so Andy, what I was saying, I, I heard somebody mention about Grenfell. Uh, if I might be allowed just to say a couple of things on that. The... Uh, as, as we all know, Gren Grenfell is going on a long, long time, isn't it? But the legislation is about to change and, and lessons learned from, from that tragic event are being learned. I don't think it's something that I, I should really respond to much further for the purposes of this uh, evening's look at FIU. But certainly as an industry, we need to do a lot more. And I think a lot more will be, will be done in the future to protect uh, both fire safety and structural safety, which is one of the reasons why uh, Cross is now better funded to be able to look more at fire safety. So more to follow in the future, I think there. Steve, uh, another question is, what is the size of the cracks seen in the photos before the collapse actually happened? Okay, so I have not got data on the actual size of the cracks, but you can put your fingers in them. So I'm guessing three quarters of an inch. And there, there is one illustration showing a showing an inch wide ruler, but it's actually into the crack. It's not perpendicular to the crack. So certainly in excess of 40 times the allowable. Uh, and, and 
absolutely structural distress happening. You, it, it, like I said earlier, I'm not looking at cracks here. I'm looking at different parts of, of the structure moving apart from each other, uh, resulting in uh, the breakup of the concrete in the entire area. And and, and, and the the photograph of the the deck in the yard showing what actually was pulled out confirms uh, that those were all things that could have been look, looked at, in my view, uh, much sooner than they than they were. Steve, we have a question here that says the bridge deck appears to be overhanging during its move to position. This means the loads on the cantilevered section are reversed compared to the service loads. And they say, I was just thinking, could that be the cause of the initial cracks? Maybe you can go over what they did during the move. Yes. Yeah, so so during, during the move, they uh, went from a structure that was supported on its ends to a structure that was supported no, one node in. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the particular uh, diagonal uh, that was in compression during construction became in tension. And that's why the sequencing included the tightening up of rods in that uh, uh, diagonal to ensure that it wasn't actually in tension, that it re remained in uh, in uh, compression. And then when, of course, it, it landed, that that was reversed so that the, the bars were, were, were loosened so that then there wasn't additional uh, compression in the compression member. Uh, and and the, the reports that, that I've seen show that initial cracking occurred during the initial part of construction. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have another question. Um, I actually looking for your opinion, Steve. Uh, I suggest that too much faith put into modeling and computer design in these modern times, <laughs> especially since Euro codes have been introduced and some younger engineers don't have any tangibility for when it looks wrong do you agree absolutely uh and and that's not a fault of the younger generation stuck with computers because the computer power does allow a uh, much better and much more efficient uh, analysis but let's go back to basics here this is a simple truss at the end of the day so you've got all these wonderful fia uh, uh systems all the, all this analysis going on well, you can work out the forces by a few simple little little uh, back of the envelope calculations. You know exactly where you stand in terms of stresses and you know what the stresses in concrete are and you know what the resistance of, the, of rebar is. So you can do uh, conceptual design, as, as the structural engineers like to call it, uh, very simply. And, and I think that I, I do believe that it's, it's up to the older generation to mentor the younger generation so that they're genius ability to work with all these new computer systems says somebody who's 54 years old uh, and, and and i was an advocate for cad 30 years ago by the way uh, that the that though the older generation meant mentoring can relay the simple back of the fag packet type uh, calculations that are actually really pivotal to ensure checking i'll give you a scos a scos alert that came out not too long ago where because a column was missing from the model, they actually constructed the job before realizing that the floors were sagging and maybe there should have been a column there. So, And that's a true story. These things do happen. So, yes, I do believe that there's a case for uh, improving the conceptual design skills of people so that they don't just rely on computer outputs. I agree with you, Steve. I mean, basically our structural engineers have to understand how the loads flow through the structure to get from the structure to the ground eventually. Yeah. And they have to understand that before they rely on the, the tools of computers so that they realize that what's coming out is reasonable. So this, this, this is, uh, you can see this, I, I use this bendy ruler to model deflections and bending moments and shear forces and 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 lecturers were doing this 30 odd years ago when i was at uni and i still find it a fascinating tool to understand what's going on uh, next question uh, this one we may not be able to answer why was traffic allowed to flow when there were visible structural cracks prior to the total collapse and what were the allowable design loads 
So, so there are a number of detailed calculation analyses. So if people on this call want to look at some of the links that I've, I've given you, you can really dive into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of the forces. Uh, but basically we had, in very simple terms, 900 odd tonnes. Half of that low, half of that weight is coming down that one, one uh, diagonal. It's not quite at 45 degrees. So multiply half of 900 uh, by 1.41 and then add a little bit because your angle is not quite 45 degrees. And you can see how much load's coming down there. And then you only have to look at this cross section to realize how, how much how much stress was was going on inside those uh, in inside that corner? You don't need a computer to do that. You just need five minutes with a calculator. The next question is: It was mentioned a few times that the tension rods in the diagonal were retentioned just prior to the collapse. But the reasons why this decision was made by the engineer of record was not mentioned. Why did this happen? What was the perceived benefit from the EOR at the time from this action? Okay, so I've I've not got to the bottom of that, and it might be in things that are are available that I've not read, uh, and I can only surmise that they thought that in some bizarre way that I can't quite get my head around that by tensioning them up, they are in some way stopping the propagation of the of the failure. But the the reason why I cannot get that in my head is because the plane of the two rods was along the center line of the diagonal and the distress was happening all the way around that area that the diagonal was moving horizontally there was there was there was tension cracks showing up in the column and the end of the deck was pushing out and you can see that in the photographs that I've shown okay so so why they thought that putting additional compression into the thing that is going in the, the opposite direction for where it needs to do. Why they thought that would help, I I cannot comprehend. And I've been in this game as a structural engineer for 35 years. So 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 maybe we could try and find out why they did that. But the long and short of it was it collapsed when that was occurring. Okay. But it's probably very highly likely that it would have collapsed at some point in the future anyway because the the factors of safety were just not there with with the design it was a design error uh, propagated by a whole host of other things i haven't mentioned for instance that there's some discussion about the roughening of the joint between deck and 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 diagonal and and column uh, and and there was a requirement for an amplitude of of a uh, quarter of an inch, six millimeters or so, and 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 it's not believed. It is believed that that didn't actually get constructed, but that might have been a contributory factor, but would not have been the cause of the of the issues. Uh, and you can see that because when you look at those detailed photographs showing how bad it was just a, just a short while before the collapse, you can see that it's sliding, it's breaking up, the whole thing is being pushed out. All right, we have a question. Has the effect of torsion been studied? It appears that the structure has almost no torsional rigidity and could fail easily if torsion exists, e.g. due to eccentricity, wind load, etc. A single load path structure without torsional rigidity could be easily become unstable. Yeah, I, I, whoever's made that statement, I entirely agree with them. I think there was some evidence that there were some torsional issues because the cracking wasn't the same on both sides. So if you go into the details of the reports that have been provided, there is some uh, talk about the, the cracking being... Uh, not consistent across both sides. In other words, there was some torsion happening. Uh, I, I, I'm loath to comment in detail about that because I'm not familiar enough with the actual design of the single point of failure uh, and whether or not torsion was considered. But I would definitely expect torsion to be considered. Look, I mean, wind blowing on it is going to provide torsion. Uh, the the, the un, un uh, pattern loading from live loads 
on the deck is going to cause uh, torsion. So I can't believe for a second that they did not take account of torsion in that design because they, you know, the, 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 the bottom of those truss booms is going to have a deck on it that's doing this. So, it, so they must have been designed for torsion, but whether or not they were and how they were, I, I do not know. So I can't comment. The next is a two part question. Uh, oh. Let me address the second part and then I'll give you the first part. The first, the second part is, has responsibility liability been apportioned yet? Okay, one of the things I'd like to mention about CROSS is that it is basically a blame-free uh, culture. We do not look to blame, so we look to find out the facts and try to present errors so that people can learn from them. So we don't look for liability and blame. The first question of this uh, asker is, in your opinion, would a UK category three check have identified the design as deficient? Uh, in my view, I believe a cat three check would have uh, seen that there was a big discrepancy between the way in which one party had achieved the results and the way in which another party has achieved the results because a, a cat three check you don't look at the the other people's calculations you actually effectively have to come up with the same solution using different methodology and that methodology in certainly in network rail needs to be uh, preceded by a design check statement so that all parties can buy into how the independent analysis is going to be done so I would hope to think that that would have been picked up. But the interesting question could run to, did that include the temporary condition of the structure? Uh, because I'm, I'm pretty certain that not all the time do we look at the temporary condition of the permanent works in the way in which we should. So, so I would say that as a consequence of lessons learned from this uh, event, that that's something that we can look at. And that is something that I'm looking at as technical lead of the update to CIV 03, uh, which is work in progress. We're looking to, to issue that in December. Going back to the second question, I, I, I really do want to spend a minute uh, adding to what you said, Andy, about the, the, the fact that, that this is anonymous it's not blame okay in in my health and safety by design uh, forum which is the which is network rail people and the d supply chain we have really open conversations about things that have gone wrong and i have directors of companies asking f to to have that information and then receiving that information then working with other consultancies and designers to learn those lessons in a spirit of open, non-competitive learning for, for both lessons learned and importantly for good practice, because that's the industry coming together. And, and that is the power of what we do with Cross UK. And that's the power of what, what I do in Health and Safety by Design. It, it's the ability to bring people together to learn and, and, and share experiences so that so that we don't have to suffer uh, from such, such errors in the future. Just wanted to elaborate on that. Yes. A uh, question, I'm not sure you can answer this, but Steve, I'm gonna throw it to you. Please, could you explain how the loads were undercalculated and capacities were overcalculated, causing an error greater than a factor of two at the node that failed? And then how was this error not identified by the checkers? That's a tough one. Okay. so. It's it's approximately two. If I did say it's over two, I might be wrong because of what's in my head is about 1.95, but it was a large factor. And that was a combination of uh, over-egging the loads and under-egging the resistance. Now, I can't say here what those factors were, but in the links, there are published calculations that go into a great deal of depth about exactly what those factors were 
So anybody interested in finding out the truth to my statement that it was overloaded and underdesigned, and the factor was in the order of two uh, at point of failure, then they're welcome to look at those calculations because they're all there and they're all freely available. And, and that, I think, is something that should be applauded from the UK to the US because we just don't have that luxury in, 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 in our in, in our country. Uh, so, so there you go. There's some good lessons to be learned by, by people examining those those calculations in greater detail. Hope that helps. The Edinburgh Schools report was highly critical of site supervision and called for greater engineering supervision and reinstating the clerk of the works. To date, I'm not aware anything has changed. And Steve, if you could also, just for some of the ones that aren't in the UK, explain the clerk of the works and how it works in the UK. Yeah, yeah. So, so in, let's call them traditional forms of contract, we would have someone called a resident engineer who would typically be a a member of the consultancy who did the design, who's actually on site helping to ensure quality control and to monitor and to, to check that things were okay. And a clerk of the works would typically, uh, and this is not always the case, but typically be somebody employed by the, the local council who would be charged with going around sites and seeing that things were being done correctly and then picking people up on things that weren't being done correctly. And that the, we've still got a, Institute of of uh, of clerks of works and 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 I've I've listened to the Institute of clerks of works speak at the iStruct headquarters and I've presented in my discipline review group we call it in, in network rail on some of the findings from uh, DG one which is something that you can Google uh, and also Edinburgh schools where systematically things were not not built correctly and the quality control was atrocious we were very lucky with Edinburgh schools that we didn't kill a lot of kids. Because the the whole gable end of a of a school fell off over the place where a few hours later children would have been uh, parking their bikes and walking into school, uh, and and that led to a systematic review of all the D and B uh, schools that had been built under that framework, and there were seventeen schools that needed extensive remedial works as a consequence. So that's just power of not getting the supervision right. And I'm a big advocate for proper PC supervision and a certain level of independent supervision. Uh, and that is in a collaborative working environment. I think that might answer the question. If not, then please repeat. Steve, there's a question here. Why is there not the equivalent engineer of record for projects in the UK compared with those executed in the US? or for US clients? Very good question. Don't know the answer. Wouldn't that be a good idea? So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying there is that uh, sometimes, and this is not always the case, a DMB contractor who will be employing the engineer to do the design will receive the design and say, thank you very much. Uh, I'll give you a call when the next one is needed. Leave us to it. We'll crack on. OK, and that's the last the engineer hears about the job. OK, until something goes wrong. So I won't give you any examples now, but I've got plenty of examples on file where decisions have been made. Uh, and there's been no reference back to the engineer. And the engineer hasn't been anywhere near site and hasn't had any involvement at all in helping with the assurance of quality control. Uh, in, in, in the rail industry, we have construction managers to look at that, but we should also have adequate supervision by the PC in the first place. And so so this is a steer, away, part of the fragmentation of the industry over the past three decades is, is a steer away from that that on-site presence. And, and when you see some of the lessons learned and the good practice in the... Uh, Health and Safety by Design guidance that I showed you, and, and in John Carpenter's book, where there's plenty of other good examples as well, you'll see that there is a case for UK engineering to do more of what you do in America with the engineer of record. So I'd say that's something that need, the industry needs to look at. 
Uh, here's a question on the ABC accelerated bridge construction. At what point in the design was the decision made to use ABC? In other words, I've not heard much discussion about if the two-span configuration would have collapsed. Seems to me that structural aesthetic design was developed and then how to build it was decided, but they became stuck with a form not easily constructed the way they wanted to. Maybe some comments about the uh, okay. aesthetic so, design? So I'm not going to comment on the aesthetic design. They're, one person might love it, another person might not. But I can comment a bit on, on the, uh, the, the off-site construction, as I'll call it. Uh, accelerated construction, I think you guys call it. The... The, the parameters for the positioning of electrical cables and other things meant that to try and build it in situ with the road closed would not have been a practical solution. And, and, and I do not know, but I would suspect that the decisions to build offline and move it into position using SPMT was made early in the design process because there was a properly considered uh, review of the sequencing to incorporate that in the design. So at some point during the early design development, somebody would have decided, well, how are we going to build this? This is how we might build it. This is how we might build it. This And, and all of those conversations would no doubt have happened. Uh, like I said uh, in, in my presentation, nobody wanted or even considered that this was going to happen. But because of primarily design errors, Compounded by a number of other issues, which I've touched on in this in this uh, in this uh, presentation, that the the cracking which actually did occur when it was being originally constructed before it was moved, and then so progressively got worse over 19 days. At no point did somebody make the decision: what's going on here? We need to do something radical here. And 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 I'm sure if if the same would have happened with, in similar circumstances within, for instance, railway, uh, decisions would have been made to stop the traffic and prop the structure. Uh, and they weren't on this job. And, and I'll, I don't think I'll ever know quite why. But that, you know, think about, think about your what-if scenarios. All right, I think this will be the last question since we're getting near the end of our time period. Uh, the question starts out on reflection, designing and redundancy may have prevented the catastrophic failure. I think the real question is, is a design check on critical elements inherent in UK bridge design and would it have identified the issues here? So my understanding is that the yes is the answer. Uh, I would also say that m from my knowledge, of bridge design, which is not the greatest because I'm a building structural engineer primarily with some bridge experience. I would say that provided there was recognition of the the importance of this single load path uh, and it was engineered with sufficient resilience and resistance, it might have been proven to be a successful solution. But I, I must say I am not experienced enough to be definitive in saying that. And it'd be interesting to see what some of our bridge engineers think about the same subject. From my perspective, the, the concrete doesn't know it's in a bridge. The concrete is a mix of bits of concrete and bits of steel. And provided those bits of concrete and bits of steel are tough enough for the job and longevity is taken into account. I see no reason why a novel design can't be a successful design. Steve, I think it's time for us to wrap up. And I, I think you've set a record. I think there was over 1,300 people watching this, this presentation. So congratulations on that. And thank you so much for your presentation. We all learned from it. And th thank you, and, and and thank you for Cross for al allowing this event to happen. It, it, it you know, the collaboration across the pond has been it's been a great experience for me, and 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 hopefully we can continue working well together in the future. I hope so, also. Thank you very much.